I would like to welcome you to FIS 501, the UBC Ecosystem Modeling course. And today we are at class number eight. Uh, and it's a guest lecture by Dave Jagaris from the University of Florida, who will be talking about the local reference points for Atlantic Menhaden. And that's part of um, a process of getting ecosystem modeling into the actual fisheries management process. So quite a bit like uh, follow up to what we talked about with Jason Link a few weeks ago. I would like to acknowledge that uh, UBC is at the Coast Salish territory and uh, thus we acknowledge that we are at the ancestral, traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Tsleil-Waututh and Squamish people. Let me just mention that the recordings of this class will be available very shortly at the Ecopart YouTube channel and they are also at the Facebook page. And also a welcome to those who are listening to this on uh, Facebook Live. We very much appreciate uh, your interest in this and we will uh, monitor uh, your, what you have of questions there. So do feel free to ask questions on Facebook. Uh, we will try to sneak them into the presentation or into the discussion a little bit later. And uh, also like to mention that the uh, course has a website that we are using quite a bit and you can see the reference to it if you look down here below. So it's a new Google site called FISH 501-2021-2021. There you can find uh, the PDFs of the lectures, the links to the readings, the tutorials. And as I mentioned before, we also have a Slack workspace and at that Slack workspace uh, you can ask questions and if you do not have access to it, do feel free to send me an email to that effect. And next, uh, I would like to welcome Dave Jagaris uh, from the University of Florida. Uh, Dave uh, has been a, a lot involved in, especially in, in the recent years, in not just applying EWE, but in developing parts of it and adding new facilities and on really challenging how it can be used. And uh, I have enjoyed working with Dave for, for several years now and would, so has, I should say, Carl Walters. And Carl, I think you have joined us. I wonder if I could uh, hand it over to you to say a few words about Mr. So welcome. Oh, my pleasure to introduce Dave. Hi, Dave. Hey, Carl. Uh, uh, I started working with Dave. I've forgotten what year it was. It was in somewhere in the early 2000s when he got very lucky. Uh, most uh, state uh, fisheries management agencies don't have any stock assessment strength in the United States. Dave was lucky enough to get a job uh, with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission at the Florida Marine Research Institute that had a little team of stock assessment people who were just really, really good. Uh, his men, they became his mentors, people like Bazad Mahmoudi, who you would hear about, um, Bob Muller, so on. Uh, and these guys uh, hired Dave to work on uh, Florida fish stock assessment modeling and so on. But over time, he was encouraged to also uh, work on uh, Ecopath Ecosim models that they'd been uh, involved with uh, on the West Florida shelf. And great, uh, Dave took over that stuff uh, for Florida. And uh, they encouraged him also to start graduate work. So he started a graduate program at uh, the University of Florida and uh, ended up getting his PhD there and then uh, staying at the University of Florida after a bit of moving around. One of the most important things to me about Dave is that uh, EcoSim has a, uh, has a management, a very complicated management strategy evaluation interface where you can simulate the application of multi-fleet, multi, -fleet, multi uh, complex multi-species, multi-fleet, uh, harvest control rules that account for various kinds of uh, constraints on uh, on weak stocks and all sorts of things that people have not explored very much formally in ecosystem modeling. Uh, 
we had developed all that complicated harvest control rule stuff, put it in the code, and then nobody used it. Well, Dave started using it. And in his doctoral dissertation, he used it to generate some really interesting uh, trade-off patterns in ecosystem management on the West Florida Shelf uh, between uh, between different fishing interests and uh, and different fishing values on, on the West Coast of Florida. So I came away from that thinking that, that this guy is probably the best ecosim user as well as developer anywhere in the world because of uh, reaching out that way into policy issues and that. And since then, I think he's done, continued to do that work. He's also focused on getting ecosim to deal with all kinds of crazy things like red tides, uh, induced mortality of groupers and so on. So he's gonna tell us about some of that experience. Most welcome, Dave. Thank you, Carl. I appreciate those kind words. And I, I still talk about the days when you were down here and I would drive up to Cedar Key and we'd work together and I'd get my marching orders and then we'd get back together in a couple of weeks. And um, definitely left a, a big impact on me and my career. So thank you. All right, so today, um, as Carl mentioned, I've done a lot of uh, different things with Ecopath, Ecosim, as well as Ecospace. Um, I'm not going to be able to cover all of that today. I'm going to focus on um, a, what I consider a, a success story uh, that, that happened last year um, using, this, using this model uh, for Atlantic Menhaden on the East Coast. Uh, before, but before I get into that application, I just kind of want to give a, um, a little bit of background on sort of how I approach ecosystem models and how I communicate ecosystem models with the managers. Um, if, if you have the odds, the, the mindset that an ecosystem model is going to come in and replace everything that's, that's already within the framework, um, you're going to be uh, sadly disappointed. But actually, what, what I consider ecosystem models is another tool in the toolbox. So the, the things that, that drive management, management action um, is usually driven by stock assessments, but also data collection, uh, stakeholder input can have a large effect on management action. Um, the, the process of developing fishing regulations is usually separate from the stock assessment. And then you have ecosystem models and, and they, can, they can be added to the mix here. It doesn't replace anything. In fact, it actually leverages all these other components because you can integrate data from stock assessments and, and surveys and evaluate um, uh, stakeholder driven policy issues uh, that would that would allow managers to have more information when they go to make some decision about you know how how should we uh, you know what what should our strategic goals be to uh, to increase yields in the system or to increase um, economic gains across multiple uh, stakeholders. And so our strategy has been so far to work within the existing single species assessment and management framework. So this is here at the, the EAFM stage. And, and the, the goal here, the, the thought is that this would get our foot in the door and um, eventually allow us to do true EBFM, which as you'll see today, I think that taking this EAFM approach, at least for Atlantic Manhattan, immediately opened the door to questions regarding a larger suite of species. Um, and, and I think that it could quickly move from EAFM to EBFM, uh, provided that the management framework adjusts itself. So what can we learn from ecosystem models? Uh, the information that we can get out of them can be strategic and qualitative. Um, for example, just when to add more precaution. If there's a red tide out there and we, and we have a, and, and the model estimates that it's gonna have a, a pretty high effect on the, uh, the, the population, then should they add more precaution when they go to set the catch limits for the following year? Uh, whether to adjust stock assessment parameters. Um, models can help explain and forecast population fluctuations, evaluate harvest policies under environmental change, um, and then kind of getting up more of the, the tactical and quantitative advice, you know, trying to quantify these trade-offs between different species and, and trying to, to adjust your reference points uh, from a multi-species context. And so if we think about some of the applications here, um, you know, red tide is a big one in, on the west coast of Florida. Uh, in the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, there's, the system has been impacted by multiple stressors, including invasive lionfish, uh, 
you know, large BP oil spill in 2010, and extreme fishing pressure on, on several species that are concentrated on these reef structures. Um, you know, th there's also climate prediction models. I know that uh, there's a lot of ecopath users who have put a, done really cool stuff with climate projections recently. Um, and some of the things that I've worked on more recently is over here with these stock rebuilding plans and forage fisheries. So if you re rebuild a predator stock, how does that affect other species in the system that it might be preying upon or competing with? And then the, the bottom up effect of forage fish harvest, how does that affect predators? And that's what I'm gonna focus on today is the, the forage fish application. So this project, uh, Advancing Ecological Reference Points, well, the, I'll get into more of the history here, but I do wanna acknowledge um, the, the folks who have been involved in this. So. Uh, this work was funded in part by the Linfest Ocean Program on a grant to Andre Buchheister at Humboldt State University. And he's the, um, he's the, the developer of the, the large, the, the full um, ecosim model for the Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf. So you'll hear, hear we talk about the NWAX full model, and then we have the MICE model, which is a simplified version of that. Now I'll, I'll go into more detail on that later. Uh, but I also want to acknowledge all of the, uh, the ecological reference point work group members for, so this is a work group that was established by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Um, and, I, and of all the committees that I serve on, this is, I think, hands down the best. I mean, this is a group that we, we get together, um, you know, depending on what our charge is, we, we might meet every, every couple of months. But this is a group that actually gets together and we do work when we get together. And, and that's a lot of fun. We don't sit around and, and, and vote on things. We actually run models, we evaluate outputs, we um, develop different metrics. So it's, it's a really great group. And um, I think that the sum of the, the, sum of the parts is, uh, is more than individual components with this group. All right, so let me just give a little bit of background on Atlantic Menhaden for those of you who might not um, know much about the species. So this is a small clupeid uh, uh, schooling pelagic fish. Um, it lives in estuaries and coastal waters uh, distributed from Florida all the way up to Nova Scotia, Canada, but primarily uh, centered around the Chesapeake Bay area in the mid-Atlantic. They live to be about six to 10 years old and mature um, around one to three ages, and they reach a maximum length of about 30 centimeters. They do have a seasonal and ontogenetic movement pattern. Um, mainly in the summer, the larger individuals will migrate up north, and in the winter, they'll migrate south to around Cape Hatteras where, they're, where they spawn. Uh, we're learning more that some of those larger individuals actually stay um, in the northern regions throughout the year, uh, while the smaller ones migrate back and forth. Um, this is also a filter feeder, and, and as you might expect, it's a, a main forage fish for many birds, uh, fish, and marine mammals. So the role in the ecosystem is, has been well known for, for decades. Um, Menhaden have, are, are known to be the primary forage fish in this system. Um, and they are food for, you know, resident and estuarine coastal fish, <clears throat> things like striped bass, bluefish, weak fish, as well as high, highly migratory fish, big tunas and billfish will, will migrate in and out of the system different times of the year, feed on menhaden schools, as well as marine mammals and birds. Um, at certain times of the year, you can see these uh, big flocks of birds just um, following Menhaden schools around for days uh, right along the coast. And it's pretty impressive. Looks like something out of a Discovery Channel video. Uh, they also have a role in water filtration um, and, and just some back of the envelope calculations, you know, estimate that up to 30 trillion kiloliters of water can be filtered each year um, through this, from this population. We're going to focus mainly on the, the food web aspect of Menhaden. And primarily on these three species here, bluefish, weakfish, and most importantly, striped bass. These are three species that are also managed by the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. And striped bass in particular uh, has been known to have a strong interaction with menhaden. And there's been a lot of tension between the striped bass sport fish uh, lobbying groups and the menhaden commercial fishing uh, industry um, going back several decades now. And so this is a, a conflict that has been present for a while. So a little bit about the fishery here. So this is uh, the, the Atlantic Menhaden fishery has been around um, since the 1800s, actually. Uh, I think it started off of Beaufort, North Carolina. And they primarily harvest Menhaden for fish oil, fish soluble, and fish mills. So they have these big 
uh, mothership boats that you see down here at the bottom. And uh, they have the two runner boats that will go out and pull a big persane around a school of fish. <clears throat> um, they haul them into the factory and they, they reduce them down to these, these products. And that's for that reason, we call it a reduction fishery. Uh, back in the heyday, the 1950s, there were about 20 factories dotted up and down the East Coast. Um, that's now down to one factory in Reedsville, Virginia. Um, so the, you can see the, the effort and landings have declined considerably over time since about the, definitely since the 1950s and again since the 1980s. Um, some of that is market driven. Uh, some of that is also uh, some more restrictive management uh, policies that have gone in place. Uh, but by, by weight, by tonnage, uh, they land about 150,000 metric tons per year currently. And that makes it the largest fishery on the U.S. East Coast by weight. Now, there's also a smaller bait fish fishery, and that, and that fishery is growing. In fact, they're trying to get, Maine is trying to get more menhaden allocation currently because their Atlantic herring stocks are down and they need bait to feed their lobster fishery. Um, so there's now an allocation battle going on with this fishery, um, which, which these models aren't designed to address yet. Uh, but the bait fishery accounts for about 25% of the total landings, and that, that portion is growing. <clears throat> so the men assessed and managed um, through a, a regular process that is organized through the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission. Uh, there's a board that manages the species that has represent representatives from each member state. Um, Virginia does something a little bit different. Uh, just a, a year or two ago, they were able to take control over their, their inshore waters. Uh, but what motivated this work is Amendment 3 to the Fishery Management Plan, which was um, established in 2017 that called for the adoption of ecological reference points um, by the year 2019. And so this is what the ERP work group was tasked with. It's managed based on a coastwide total allowable catch, so a TAC. And then there's an allocate, allocation system across states and bait versus uh, reduction sectors. And in 2019, the TAC was 216,000 metric tons. Um, now, the stock is assessed uh, by NOAA uh, out of the NOAA Beaufort Lab. And this is done through a process with you know, technical committees, the ERP work group, and a, a, the CDAR review process. And it's done with a, a typical statistical catch at age model. And the 2019 assessment determined the, the status of the stock was not overfished or experiencing overfishing. All right, so along the path of these ERPs, um, so this has been a work in progress for some time. So this committee that I talked about, the ERP work group actually uh, was initiated in, uh, I'd say around 2015. So it used to be the, uh, the multi-species work group and and in the early 2000s, they put a lot of effort into developing these multi-species virtual population analyses. And the, the most of those models were used for was to take outputs of predation mortality and then plug them into the, uh, into the single species stock assessment. They were never able to do any type of management or policy evaluation. And so around 2015, we sort of Failed on the multi-species VPA. Uh, we, we went through an update process and we just, and it was very unstable and it just wasn't making sense. So we, we bailed on the VPA and at the same time, we recommended to the commission that they have a, an ecosystem management objectives workshop where they pull together stakeholders and try to define the, the management objectives for the species. And based on those, based on those recommendations, uh, we started developing another suite of models. Um, these range from simple, surplus production models to multi-species statistical catch at age models, all the way up to full-blown ecosystem models. In 2017, Amendment 3 passed and we were given two years to develop these ERPs. And that took us up to 2019. At the end of the year, we were able to um, present this model that you'll see today through the CDAR technical review process and it passed, um, which we then went and followed up, presented those ERPs to the board, uh, back and forth throughout the course of 2020, uh, the board had lots of questions and recommendations, and I'll, I'll mention some of those towards the end. Uh, but finally, in August of last year, they decided to, to go ahead and vote on this, and it passed unanimously to accept the ERPs that you'll see uh, today. And so that really marks a milestone and a change in management for this, uh, for the commission and for the species. And There'll be another update and another assessment. Um, so this is hopefully gonna be part of the routine management 
following up again in 2023. All right, so what, so what did we do at, as, as this ERP work group? I mentioned that we, we developed multiple models and we took this kind of multi-model approach um, because the objectives were very, were very broad in terms. And so we, we sort of had, had to define specifically what, how we wanted to address each objective. And we had a lot of expertise on the committee and people who had done a lot of modeling with different approaches. And so we all sort of developed our own models um, within the committee. And these range from you know, simple surplus production with time varying R to a, a surplus production model with predation effects, um, the multi-species statistical catch at age, uh, the MICE model that you'll see today, and that was built off of the, the NWAX full ecosystem model. And uh, we actually recently had a paper published that goes through all these models and how we use them, how we compared them. And, and what was interesting from this approach is that where we could compare metrics across models, they were all very similar. They were all telling us a similar story about Manhattan productivity over time. And I think that that uh, helped us in the review process to get the MICE model passed. We decided as a committee that we're gonna put the MICE model forward. Uh, and, but we also presented that within the context of these other analyses. I think it, it added a lot of credibility and the, the review panel really appreciated that. <clears throat> so going back a little bit to those ecosystem management objectives. Um, so what came out of that workshop that I mentioned were four fundamental objectives. And these were to sustain Menhaden to provide for fisheries, sustain Menhaden to provide for predators, uh, provide stability for all fisheries and, and minimize risk due to the changing environment. And we had these modeling approaches. And, and so we were able to go through and sort of determine which models address the, the most of those, uh, those objectives. And there's different performance measures here that, that are associated with each objective. And, and the NWAX, which this NWAX represents both the mice and the, and the full ecosystem model, checked most of those boxes. One of the things that we, we started going down the road of this still Henderson surplus production model um, which was basically Menhaden and two predators, but it did not have the bottom-up feedbacks from, from prey to predators the way it was configured. And in fact, the, the ecosystem models were the only ones that had a mechanism for bottom-up feedbacks from prey to predators. The, the Vader model, which is the multi-species statistical catch at age, did not have that. Um, and so that really allows ecosystem to do far more in terms of policy analysis than, than what these other approaches could do. So the Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf Ecosim models, as I mentioned before, we started with the full NWAX model that was developed by Andre Buchheiser. This model had 61 functional groups and you know, the, the full suite of menhaden predators from fish all the way up to birds and marine mammals. And it had been previously calibrated, actually as part of this project, it was updated through 2017, the calibration process. It had previously been calibrated through 2010, I believe. So we took that model and we reduced it down to the MICE model. Which, so we went from 61 model groups to 17 model groups, and we focused on Menhaden, striped bass, weak fish, bluefish, and spiny dogfish. And this is the model that was ultimately used to develop the ERPs. Now, how we made that decision, uh, you know, that, how, the decision that we made of which species to include in the MICE model, that was done by the committee. Um, and we, we looked carefully at all the diet data um, and, and all to, to basically limit it down to this suite of predators. So what are MICE models here? So MICE models are these models of intermediate complexity for ecosystem assessment. And I believe it was uh, first termed by Eva Pagani in the Fish and Fisheries paper in 2014. <clears throat> and these models are meant to be you know, question driven and context specific with uh, much more re reduced complexity in terms of the number of functional groups. And they, they tend to have more of a tactical focus. And this diagram over here on the right out of the paper um, I think really highlights, you know, what a MICE model is. And so here you have these different, um, uh, where you have the ecological component, you might have a full food web, but the MICE model, the, the, the amorphous thing in gray underneath it, really only brings in a subset of that. And so while the food web on, in the Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf is way more comp complex than what we were including in our MICE model, we're focusing on this core uh, interaction between Menhaden and these three or four predators. And so there's several reasons that we decided to go to a MICE model approach. Um, 
while the the full model was is was stable and calibrated well, there was just a lot of uncertainty in some of the in a lot of the groups. For example, mammals and birds and things that we don't have good data on, and we were very concerned that taking that through a formal review process uh, would be very challenging. And so we 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 started going this mice route. One reason to basically remove those groups with high uncertainty and to focus on the key predators that are managed by the Atlantic States uh, Commission. But another reason was, was also for convenience. This, if this approach is supposed to be updated every three to five years along with the stock assessment, we needed a model that was going to be more nimble um, and that we could update it within the, the assessment and management timeframe. And we also had a lot of computational efficiency gains and, and that allowed us to, to fit the model a lot of different ways, do a lot of different, um, under a lot of different configurations. And I think that served us well in the end. <clears throat> So we fit the model to the MICE model to 18 indices of abundance. And these were not taken, th these were the indices of abundance used in the stock assessments. We weren't fitting to actual stock assessment data. We made to stock assessment output. We made that decision early on because we were anticipating some criticism if we went that route. Um, and so we're fitting to fisheries independent surveys, trawl surveys, things like that, as well as um, uh, fishery dependent catch rates coming from the recreational creel surveys. And so we had 18 indices of abundance and 10 catch time series. In total, we fit 32 different ecosim models to these data with different, different configurations for prey switching, foraging time adjustment. Uh, we applied these vulnerability caps that we developed. Now I'll, I'll talk more about those towards in the later part of this. Uh, different, different assumptions about diet compositions with and without primary production anomalies. Uh, we even tried some cool things using the other mortality forcing to basically impose some recruitment deviations in the model. Um, so we did a lot of different things. We were able to do that because of the MICE approach. And so that, I think that there's some, there's some advantages to having a simple model with that respect. Uh, we had this repeated search methodology, which I'll demonstrate at the end uh, of the class. <clears throat> and we basically settled on a single best fit run. So here you see the fits to biomass. Uh, one thing I like to show is if you look at our striped bass fits to biomass here from Ecosim, um, it doesn't look like we're capturing, well, we aren't capturing those, those increases in abundance in the mid to late 90s, but neither did the stock assessment model. Um, so we're fitting the data with Ecosim about as well as the single species assessment models are. And then the fits to catch were, uh, were generally better than the fits to abundance. And then we looked at some other diagnostics uh, after fitting, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about these later as well, but it's things like expecting the equilibrium MSY, uh, FMSY, and looking at the emergent stock recruit relationships as a, as a diagnostic after fitting the models. All right, so let's go back to the, uh, the ecological reference points and the objectives. So the, I think the primary objective out of those four fundamental objectives were to sustain menhaden to provide for predators. But they didn't say, they didn't specify which predators or at what level to sustain them at. Um, and as a committee, we recognized that there was no single correct answer to this, uh, but there was gonna be a continuum of solutions along a trade-off frontier. Um, which determines how you value these different predator and prey uh, species in the system. So the first thing we, we wanted to do was identify, you know, which predators uh, should we be most concerned about? So what are the, which predators are most sensitive to Menhaden harvest? So we used, we primarily used the, the full NWAX model for this analysis because it had the larger suite of predators. And what it showed was that um, things like bluefish and weakfish did demonstrate a, a relatively weak response to Menhaden harvest, whereas the strongest response to Menhaden harvest uh, was in striped bass and the, the nearshore Piscivorous birds group. And so we, we basically moved forward with a simple model and developing the ERPs based on the relationship to striped bass alone under the assumption that any management actions that, that would sustain striped bass should also maintain the other predators that are less sensitive. And so we were using striped bass as sort of our canary in the coal mine here, rather than trying to develop, come up with an optimum uh, reference point across all of these species. Uh, we assumed that 
benefits to striped bass would benefit other species in the system. <clears throat> so how do we develop these ERPs? Um, so what you see here on the right is a, actually, let me see if I can get my uh, pointer. Can y'all see my mouse moving? Dave, if you, uh, if you, uh, yeah, you go, okay. Yep. We can see it. All right. Uh, so what we see here is this is in, this is striped bass biomass going from 1985 to 2017. And the black line is a historical reconstruction from our best fit model. And then going forward, these color lines are our projections under different levels of Menhaden harvest. Now in the projection scenario, striped bass is held constant at their, at their target fishing mortality rate for this figure. And then as we, as we cut Menhaden fishing down to zero, you get increases in striped bass. And as you increase it, you get declines away from its biomass targets and threshold. And so these are 40 year projection scenarios that we ran over a combination of Menhaden and striped bass fishing mortality rates. So we take, the, we take the terminal year estimate from, from these projections and we put them into a surface plot. And so we can, now we can plot Atlantic Menhaden F on the x-axis and striped bass on the y-axis. <clears throat> and these areas in the red uh, would indicate that the, the striped bass is below its threshold and areas in the cooler colors are above the target. And what we're trying to do is identify where the um, What's the combination of striped bass and menhaden fishing mortalities that would maintain striped bass at their target in an equilibrium context? And so if we put some lines up here where we have the current fishing mortality rate for menhaden is a little bit less than 0.2 and the current, men, current fishing mortality for striped bass was about 0.3. Um, and what this shows us is that at the current level of um, striped bass fishing, which is, is, it was determined to be overfished in the last assessment, it doesn't matter what you do to Menhaden, you're always gonna be below the threshold. And so the first action that would need to take place would be to reduce the F on striped bass. Um, even if you shut Menhaden down completely, um, you would still be overfishing striped bass or striped bass would still be overfished. <clears throat> now, if we fish striped bass at their F target, uh, which came out of the single species assessment, which is a rate of 0.2, we now, are crossing these biomass targets and thresholds uh, at a range of Menhaden F rates. And so where, the, where, the, where it crosses the biomass target threshold and, the, biome and the, the biomass target and the biomass thresholds is what we're defining as our ERP uh, fishing mortality targets and fishing mortality thresholds. Now, an easier way to look at this is if we just take this slice here in yellow and we plot it as a, as a single trade-off curve where we have Menhaden F on the x-axis. And now we have the striped bass biomass as a ratio to the biomass target on the y-axis when striped bass is fished at their F target of 0 0.2. These, trade, these, these reference points uh, really stand out. So the ERPF target, again, is the uh, maximum Menhaden F that maintains striped bass at their B target, whereas the ERP F threshold is the maximum F that maintains striped bass at their biomass threshold. Plotted here in red are their single species values for Menhaden, so the single species threshold and the single species target. And so both of these um, ERP F rates uh, represent reductions from the single species value uh, of about 30 to 40 percent lower than the single species reference points, but it's still actually a little bit higher than the current F for Menhaden. And, and, and I should mention that the, the board had, had made some pretty conservative uh, management decisions in the past uh, leading up to this. And so they, I think it was by luck and coincidence that, that we actually ended up in about the same place with the reductions that they had made to the, to the TAC, uh, put them pretty close to the ERPF target. <clears throat> now, after we presented this figure uh, to the board in early 2020, they, they started asking some very interesting questions. For example, um, what would happen if the ecosystem was different? What would happen if all the, all the species in this model were allowed to recover to their biomass target, the green line here? Or what if all the species in the model were 
uh, were fished at their were reduced to their biomass threshold. Now, some of that, some species are going up, some species are going down depending on their current status. For example, spiny dogfish uh, would, would go down in both of these scenarios because their biomass is really high. Uh, but the point here is that, well, we had the black line, which is everything at the status quo, and this represents our baseline ERPs. When they asked, you know, well, what if everything is at the biomass target, the green line, all of a sudden that, that trade-off curve really flattened out. And we were all like, uh, uh oh, so now you know our, our model is kind of all over the place, right? Like, where do we go? So now it's basically saying that you could fish Minhaden um, pretty much as hard as possible without reducing striped bass below the threshold. So we started looking closer into this, and we we learned that this effect here that's causing this green uh, ERP to go over, you know, further at a higher F was a result of. Uh, the lack of seasonality in the model, uh, specifically related to striped bass and Atlantic herring. So Atlantic herring are more northern in the system and striped bass migrate north in the summer and they feed on Atlantic herring. And we don't have that, that seasonality in the model. And what the model was, was estimating was that striped bass were eating Atlantic herring at about 30% of their diet throughout the entire year. But we know from, from all the diet studies that, that that's just not true and also based on their migration patterns. And so to, to sort of explain the effect of this in the model to managers, uh, we applied this uh, forcing function to the bass herring vulnerability, a seasonal forcing function that would allow for higher vulnerabilities in the summer and lower vulnerabilities in the winter. And when we did that, it resulted in a much narrower range of uh, reference points. So here on the left is the base model. The, the dotted line is, is the line in green that I just showed you. Uh, they've just been colored different in this figure. When we added that seasonal effect in, so that striped bass and menhaden interaction was not as strong throughout the year, uh, we see these, our, our reference point uh, converge back to the status quo value. <clears throat> and so, on the one hand, this opened the door for a lot of other research and modeling developments. Um, as far as, you know, as Carl likes to say, you can't be a little bit pregnant. You know, the, we couldn't be just a little bit seasonal. You know, this, this came in at the end and it would need to go back through the review process. Uh, so one of the big research recommendations moving forward is to start accounting for some of the seasonality, either within EcoSim or actually handle it explicitly through EcoSpace, which I think would be a better approach. Um, so I point this out because of one of the comments that Carl made in his, uh, in his um, lecture about the seasonality and how it can lead you to uh, fundamentally different management advice if you aren't careful about it. All right, so at, at the end of that, we, we were left with, we had the ERPs, but we still had to set a tack for management. So what we do, we took those ERPs the fishing mortality reference points, plug them back into the stock assessment model to estimate the TAC for the next two years. Um, and so this was kind of a linking of the, of the ecosystem and the single species model. We used the ecosystem model, the MICE model to, to determine the ecological reference point as an F rate. And then we plug that F rate back into the stock assessment model to get the tactical advice. Now, of course, there's still lots of work to be done. Um, as I mentioned before, the, the seasonal forcing functions, I think, is a pretty high priority, especially because the commission is really starting to ask questions about um, these other species and how they interact, and there's strong seasonality in this system, and, and it's def the model is definitely sensitive. That can be handled through the eco-space spatial temporal approach. Now, I think that the, the conflict between the sport fishing group and the, and the Manhattan industry could probably be addressed through the policy optimization. And this is some of those trade-off curves that Carl was alluding to that I looked at as part of my dissertation, where you can assign different values to the species, different monetary values. So the, the value of a recreationally caught fish versus the value of, um, of a forage fish. And while biologically the model may suggest that, yeah, there's enough food out there uh, to keep fishing Manhattan at this particular rate, Economically, there might you might get a different answer, um, and so this would be uh, an interesting analysis here if you want to actually optimize the system, uh, given some socioeconomic considerations. <clears throat>
Uh, there's also, you know, we, we do want to broad, eventually broaden the mice model and start to be able to run the, run the same analyses with the full model because there are other predators that have uh, constituencies that, are, that care about them. So things like birds and mammals that um, folks want to, to make sure that menhaden are, um, there's enough menhaden there to satisfy their, their demands. Um, and, and you'll see in the tutorial that I'll give, uh, you know, some of the issues that we had with the parameter estimation in Ecosim and estimating those vulnerabilities, uh, the sensitivities to that. I think that there could be some improvements in the model made there um, as far as, you know, maybe some penalized bounds or, or, or something to keep those vulnerabilities off the upper and lower bounds uh, to give more stable results. Uh, we're still going to move forward with developing these other models. There's a lot of interest in the multi-species statistical catch and age model. Um, I, I think there's a long ways to go with that because it's still working in, this, in these discrete time steps and uh, they just aren't able to kind of capture those uh, fine scale trophic dynamics um, that, that Ecosim does. As all of these, as any ecosystem model goes, I don't think there's ever been an ecosystem model that had completely adequate diet studies. We have a lot of diet data collected on the East Coast, uh, but there's still regions and seasons where we have none, and there's a lot of um, larger predators offshore where we don't have diet data at all. <clears throat> so I mentioned earlier that I thought this was a big success story, and, and I think as a committee, we all felt like we had um, really done something important. Um, and while, you know, these ERPs, you know, took a long time to develop, I'd say, you know, 10, at least 10, probably 15 years, uh, you know, it only took 10 years for the Apollo missions, you know, to make it to the moon. It took us a little bit longer um, to get the ERPs done, uh, but I think it was a still a, a big step for us, um, and there's a lot more work to be done. There's the comments from the board during their meetings uh, do suggest that these broader ecosystem considerations are of interest and they're likely to be you know, coming down in the future. Uh, but the management structure will, out, will need to adapt to, be, to accommodate those types of questions. And what I mean by that is that in the ASMFC, it's sort of structured where you have this overarching commission and you've got these policy boards and each of the different species have their own board that manages them. Well, these boards meet at different times in different rooms and they don't really talk to each other much. But as we start talking about uh, the effect of Menhaden on reference points for striped bass, bluefish and weak fish, um, we, we have to get these people in the room together uh, to try to uh, develop the, come up with management objectives and reference points you know, for all these species combined because we do see that there's effects of bluefish on striped bass, bluefish eat, juvenile striped bass, uh, weak fish are a prey and a predator in the system. And so there's really, what the model is kind of telling us is that there's really no way to achieve all of the targets for these three predators simultaneously. There's gonna be trade-offs. Um, and, and so these, the commission will have to sort of restructure how they do business to address that in an ecosystem-based management way. All right, so just some summary and conclusions. Um, the, those, the Menhaden ERPs were established with the Ecosim mice model, and they were based on the effect that Menhaden harvest has on striped bass, which was determined to be the most sensitive uh, predator fish. Uh, the ERP target and threshold values should maintain striped bass at their targets and threshold biomass, and that's when striped bass are fished at their F target. Uh, as I mentioned, the next iteration will need to incorporate additional predators as well as those spatial and seasonal processes. And obviously you can see this slide is outdated because uh, the ERP did indeed pass on August 4th, um, and that is a first step towards EBFM. And one of the few cases, I think it's the only case in the U.S. where an ecosystem model was used to set a reference point based on the, the effect that one species has on another species. Um, and so it's, it is a, a big step forward. And with that, I will uh, take any questions that you guys have. Thank you very much, Dave. That was great. Nice to see this kind of prog progress. And uh, we, do have, um, we do have some questions coming in, but uh, we also have two students that have uh, prepared an introduction to a couple of papers.
and uh, that is that includes the uh, 2020 um, paper in front of in marine science that you referred to about the clock of reference points uh, which Alexis is going to give a big brief introduction to and then um, Mina is going to be introducing a big task the CETA 69 Manhattan assessment report and for those of you who looked at it, you've probably been terrified to see that we're talking about hundreds of pages. Uh, so, of course, it's going to be an, an impression from it. It's not, certainly it's not going to cover the... I, I can't uh, believe you, you had them read that report, Billy. No, not read it. <laughs> I talked to her and I think uh, scanning it and finding some sort of interest. That report is mainly included in the reading list in order to give an idea about how much goes into this yeah. whole process. That's the purpose of, of having it there. So, um, Alexis, are you uh, ready to give a really brief introduction? I am, yes. Super. You should be able to share your screen if you want to. Okay. Okay. So thank you, David, that was, um, that was wonderful. And I'm basically going to repeat a lot of what you just said. Um, so this paper titled Ecological Reference Points for Atlantic Manhattan established using an ecosystem model of intermediate complexity it was done in 2020. And the goal of this paper was to develop quantitative ecological reference points for Manhattan to account for the trade off between their harvest and striped bass biomass in the Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf region. And they focus on the trade-off relationship with Manhattan and striped bass in particular, because as mentioned, um, Manhattan are heavily harvested and there needs to be an establishment for ecosystem-based fisheries management approaches. And um, they are prey to the commercially and recreationally important fin fish like striped bass and bluefin tuna. And as David stated, the striped bass had the strongest response to Manhattan harvest. So this was determined as the most sensitive and therefore served as the indicator of ecosystem impacts. And the ERPs, um, their objectives were previously defined by managers and they are to sustain Manhattan for directed fisheries and sustain Manhattan for the predator species. And this was estimated based on the relationship between the Manhattan fishing mortality rates and then the striped bass biomass ratios when the bass were fished at the biomass target and then all the other species were fished at the 2017 status quo levels. And then the model they used was the ecosystem model um, Northwest Atlantic Continental Shelf, the MICE model. And they ended up breaking this down from the 61 functional groups that were originally included to just the 17 functional groups, which I thought was pretty cool and impressive. Um, and then all of this was done in an effort to support ecosystem-based fisheries management. Um, these ERPs were fed back into these stock assessment models and done to provide information on total allowable catch and define stock assessments. Um, I like this figure the most from the paper because I really think it gets to the crux of, of the goal and the discussion. Um, to hit the target defined by the managers that I just uh, stated, they ended up putting together this, this threshold curve. And another interpretation I got from it, um, aside from David's explanation, was that we can see that the single species threshold, um, these red lines here, uh, is much higher when you don't consider the trade-off relationship. And one step further, when you consider the management decision these ERP blue lines um, for a single species, the thresholds for fishing changes again. Um, the green line determines a set of solutions along the trade-off frontier where both Manhattan harvest and the striped bass biomass were higher and above the trade-off curve. So it's kind of the sweet spot here. And then 
So basically this ERPF target is the Manhattan um, fishing mortality rate that man maintains the striped bass biomass target rate. So this is what they ended up setting as the threshold for management decisions. So in conclusion, um, combining these different approaches for this MICE model or within this MICE model allowed managers to assess the trade-offs between these two species. Um, the results, as mentioned, were implemented back into the stock assessment models to provide the tactical advice for the total allowable catch. And, and um, I didn't realize it was 10 to 15 years of work, but I just have to say that's um, an incredible achievement. And I hope that these ERPs are kind of implemented and used elsewhere because they seem very useful and welcoming for policy. So thank you. Thank you, Alexis. I'm sure this will be a model for work in many other areas. And Nina on Mission Impossible, how uh, are you going to summarize a report of 300 pages or something like that? Yeah, I can share my screen. First, hi, and thank you so much for your great presentation. And my name is Lina, I'm second year master's student in the general department of industry. Today I'm going to briefly introduce Cedar and their January 2020 report about Atlantic Manhattan stock assessment. First, what Cedar? It's Southeast Data Assessment and Review. It's a cooperative project conduct conducted in one of three Southeast region. As you can see, it's uh, for South Atlantic Gulf of Mexico. Sorry. Gulf of, uh, Mexico and US Caribbean uh, part, and it, it was built on 2020. And the main goal of the CEDAR is improving the quality and reliability of fishery stock assessments. And also they, ha they has a website, you can find all the projects by the species or uh, cooperators there uh, from the beginning of uh, their works. And they have a bunch of events and workshops you can uh, attend because they are uh, uh, open to public. And what's Atlantic Manhattan? As uh, David mentioned, uh, Atlantic Manhattan uh, habitat is a coastal and estuarine uh, waters from Nova Scotia to Northern Florida. It's from herring family, family and it's forage fish. So it's very important link between primary producers and upper level predators. And also it's uh, very important as a fishery aspect. So the goal of this uh, workshop and this report is examination a group of models to develop the ecological reference point and estimate population parameters for, for the Atlantic Manhattan. This approach ranges from a simple model with minimal data requirements uh, and a few assumptions to the very complicated and complex model that uh, needs uh, much more data and complex um, assumptions. The first model that um, they were talking about in this report is time varying intersync growth rate uh, surplus production model that um, it, it has, it can only estimate the change in the productivity without attributing them to the particular uh, reason. The second and third model is a steel Henderson model and multi-species statistical catch at age model. They can predict the effect of Atlantic Manhattan harvest on striped bass biomass. So it means they can predict the bottom up effects on Atlantic Manhattan. And then the full ecosystem model, uh, which is required a lot of data and a lot of effort to build this model. So they conclude that the best model that can fit the both bottom up uh, and top-down effects on the Atlantic uh, Manhattan biomass level is the moderate complexity ecopath with ecosystem model with a limited predator prey field. And yeah, that's it. You're muted, Billy. Uh, Jerome keeps scolding me for uh, not muting when I'm not speaking. So uh, I, of course, blame Jerome as I always do whenever there's any problem that I'm uh, behind. Um, 
Thank you very much, and thank you, Dave. Uh, we uh, are open for questions, and uh, I actually think I would like to start with a question from Facebook, because I don't see too many coming up here um, that I will read up, uh, read for you, uh, Dave. Men hate not fill the fetus. It's from David Richards. Men hate not fill the fetus, phytoplankton or zooplankton? Question mark. Did you evaluate menhaden fisheries effect on how menhaden affect plankton dynamics, such as algal blooms? Oh, you also muted. Blame Jerome, like I do. I was unmuted until Jerome, until you said something about Jerome, and I didn't, I didn't want him to come down on me too. So shame on Jerome. Uh, <laughs> anyhow, so no, we did not look at those filter feeding effects of um, of menhaden. Um, there's there's a lot of work that's gone on in the Chesapeake Bay as far as you know the role that menhaden have in water filtration and how that you know enhances water quality. That was not one of the objectives for this work, and quite frankly, I don't know that we have. I, I don't know that these models have the proper resolution to at the lower trophic levels to address that. I mean the phytoplankton blooms are happening at a finer time scale um, than. Uh, than what these models are capturing <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm not sure that it would this would be the best approach to, to answer that question thank you dave and uh, i would add to it that one thing we talk quite a bit about in this course here is you make your model to address specific questions yes it may be uh, useful to address questions like these but that's not what this model was built for it's really for addressing some very specific management questions of interactions. And one has to focus on those in order to get anywhere with the analysis. What you can do with models like, like the full ecosystem models is a lot. And you just can't do a lot. If this was took longer than the moon mission, uh, you, can, you can easily see that if you add to that, you'll never get the results out. Um, I don't... I think actually I would like to ask the uh, ask you something about the process there. Uh, a colleague who is into mice models says that as long as he's editor for um, a certain journal, they will not accept any ecosystem modeling paper that accepts output uh, from assessment models as input into ecosystems model. So the question of models feeding models. Now, that's pretty much unavoidable when you work across uh, species and work with things that address multiple species. You had discussions about this. How do, did those discussions span out? Well, I think there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Um, it it, it kind of depends on what your objective is. If, you're, if you have these, um, these stock assessment programs that are taking place and you look and you're looking for a way to integrate those assessments into one, then it might be, you might be okay to use the assessment outputs as inputs into the model because you could then say, okay, we've captured the same, we're, we're replicating the same dynamics of the stock assessments and they're all linked together through the trophic interactions. And then you could use that to use the model to make uh, projections and policy analysis. Um, but I think that where it, uh, from, from the ecosystem modeling standpoint, the the potential downsides is that those assessment models might be smoothing over some of the variability um, that the ecosystem model could actually pick up. And so from that perspective, it's, it might be better to actually include the raw data. Uh, we took this approach um, because there were, you know, our, our committee didn't always agree on things. Um, and and we, we talked about this because we, we didn't want to fall into this trap of fitting to models. And we knew that some of the species like bluefish and wheatfish um, have, the stock assessments have historically been poor. Um, some of them haven't even passed. And so we wanted to actually put the raw data into the ecosystem model. Um, uh, just, I think, to add more, more rigor to it. And also if there were uh, declines in abundances that maybe weren't explained by the stock assessment model that could have been due to trophic interactions, then our hope was that the the ecosystem model would pick that up. Otherwise, it would have just been a, 
a flatter line. Now the ecos, the, the fits always look better when you fit to a stock assessment output. They always, yeah. you know, almost connect the dots, and that and that's nice. But um, you know, that, I think wherever you can, you should, you should, or maybe you could do it both ways. You know, if, if you've got a model uh, to see if you get different answers. You have to. Be can I add just a bit there yeah. that that Billy didn't explain it properly what the objection was. The objection was fitting ecosystem models to the results of stock assessment models, not fitting to the data used in them, but pretending that the assessment outputs are data. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you answered that properly, and I answered it the same way earlier. It's uh, in, there are situations where the assessment model is actually given a better historical reconstruction than uh, is visible in the raw data. And there are also, you pointed out, situations where the ecosystem model would not be taken seriously unless you could demonstrate that it gave the same behavior as the single species model. And that demonstration requires fitting the ecosystem model to the stock assessment model results in order to ensure that they are comparable in outputs. Yeah, I think there's some figures that maybe weren't in that the big CDAR report, but internally we we would compare that when we fit ecosim with with the the raw data and then compared the outputs to the trends from the stock assessment. They ended up being quite similar. Um, I think we showed that to the review panel, but it, it wasn't right. Much well, it was neat that you found that none of them worked very well. Could I ask you another question here? I uh, I keep getting. I think Ray Hilborn is the one who's been uh, arguing about models used to look at the striped bass menhaden interaction, not accounting properly for the possibility that most of the striped bass predation is occurring during a part of the menhaden's life cycle when uh, on small juvenile menhaden that have, uh, that have strongly density dependent mortality, in which case the net recruitment rate of menhaden may not be affected much at all by changes in bass abundance and vice versa. Uh, or, or I think an alternative he argued was that perhaps the bass consumption is primarily after menhaden have uh, been through density dependent juvenile mortality. So the recruitment of menhaden has actually been limited by density dependent effects and then all striped bass are doing in that case is competing directly with the fishery. Have you, did you run into those arguments that Ray was bringing up while you were doing this modeling and how did you respond to them? Uh, so those came up, I think, early on in the process um, when we were at sort of structuring the model. And, and so as, as a result of the, that study, uh, we, made, we tried to make sure that we had adequate age structure in the model. So we, we have striped bass and you'll see when I open up the model later on, you'll see we have striped bass as three different age stanzas, and then we have menhaden as two age stanzas. So we have uh, predation on juveniles. We do still have some predation on the, the adult menhaden, or what we're calling age, age one plus. Um, it's possible that maybe we need finer resolution in the age structure of menhaden to capture, yeah. to capture some of that, but-, uh, no, but I just, I think I killed that argument. Well, Hillborn asked me, he said, well, what do you, what's the matter? This ecosim thing doesn't even have age structure. So how could it capture these effects? And I just said, don't you guys need to find out what, what ecosystem is. Uh, it does have age structure and size structure and that you are wrong to claim that the models that you guys are developing don't have that structure. So hopefully I've just defrayed and you just stopped that whole line of argument from him and his buddies. Anyway, sorry. Okay, no, thank you. And um, we still have a number of questions and the plan is we'll continue for another 10, 15 minutes with questions. And then um, Dave is going to demonstrate the model, as you mentioned, and including some aspects of the time series fitting. Uh, Emma, you had a question. Yeah, hi, Dave, thank you for the talk. Um, so in your paper, you addressed this um, and you said that a lot of the, the total mortality of Menhaden wasn't actually accounted for in the MICE model. 
Um, and I was just wondering how much lower the Menhaden ecotrophic efficiency was in the mice model compared to the full model. And then why would both models have had such high amounts of unexplained mortality? Yeah, so this, this is a really big question. It came up in the CDAR review and actually had to you know, stay up all night in the hotel room doing some different runs for, for the next day as is typical in these things. Um, but so there's, there's several sources of uncertainty there. Uh, first of all, the, both models, as you pointed out, had low egotrophic efficiencies of menhaden, lower than we might have expected for a forage group. We, we would expect that more with the mice model than the full model. Um, but I think actually what is driving that, so one of the, so there's all the issues with diet data and everything, but what, what we narrowed it down to really is um, the estimated biomass and, and natural mortality rates of Menhaden that we use to initialize the model in, in Ecopath. And so for all of those species that had assessments, we used, we had, we did still rely on the stock assessments to actually get the, the initial biomass and mortality rates. As part of the CDAR, as part of the Menhaden stock assessments, so the last three stock assessments have incrementally increased the natural mortality rate. Um, and I can't remember, it used, it used to be point, 0.7 was the assumed rate. Now it's 1.17 based off of a, a tagging study. And those mortality rates have been through all types of reviews and been critiqued a hundred different ways. <clears throat> um, but one of the decisions we made as a committee is that we, we weren't going to deviate from the decisions that were made as part of the stock assessment process. Um, so if the stock assessment process and the technical committee had um, decided that this would be the natural mortality rate, then that's what we use in our model. But the effect that that has is that in the stock assessment, when you increase M, you're going to get higher population abundances. And so when we at, when I first built this model with the, the outputs from the earlier stock assessment that had a lower M and therefore a lower biomass, the ecotrophic efficiency was, was much higher. But then when the new assessment was updated with the new mortality rate and the new biomass, um, that, that was the main reason for the, the ecotrophic efficiency being lower for Menhaden. Of course, we're missing a lot of predators. We're missing a lot of bird and mammal predation and, and these big pelagics. Um, so there, so there's, there's definitely a source of uncertainty there. Uh, but just the, the fact that we've increased M and biomass so high for Menhaden uh, out of the stock assessment, that was the main driver for those low ecotrophic efficiencies. But there's also, I mean, it, it, you know, our, our assumption is that this is a forage fish. Every fish must be eaten. Um, that's not, I don't think that's the case either, though, because in the summer, in, in the sounds and estuaries, uh, you get um, big low DO events and massive fish kills of these, of schools of Menhaden. So there is a lot of non-predation natural mortality that is occurring in the system. Probably not as much. You gotta, you gotta be a little bit careful there, Dave. The assumption is not that M0 represents non-predation mortality. The assumption is that if it's predation mortality, it's by predators that have not changed a lot in abundance. High M0 is not, doesn't mean non-predation mortality ever in these models. It just means high unexplained mortality and it's treated as constant, meaning if it's predation, it's, it's a constant predation rate. Right, which can yeah, arise it's... either from foraging arena limitations on predator access to the prey, as it occurs with birds or to uh, lack of predation. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and uh, you're right. You, we do have to be very careful how we, you know, when we flip back and forth between these terms, but there is, you know, outside of the model, there are large sources of non-predation mortality associated with these big. Yeah, thank you. Now, um, we have several questions uh, that relate to seasonality and spatial modeling. So I think we'll, we'll, we should start off with the seasonality aspects and Holton uh, has some, I think you can, you can open up Holton. Um, so yeah, I think the seasonality uh, component is of course super interesting. And I know the EcoSim can run on one year or one month time steps. Um, I was wondering if it could run on like interannual time steps between them, like maybe twice a year or four times a year to capture four seasons, something like that. And just in general, would this 
potentially be a more parsimonious uh, approach rather than developing a full eco space model. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, well, there's really no need to try to aggregate the time step down. I mean, if, if you've got monthly time steps, then you, know, you, you could, whatever seasonal forcing functions you use could, you know, could be at a coarser resolution. Um, but I don't, you know, I, I, we, we recognize the, that there's, you know, strong seasonality in the system that isn't built into this model. Um, but we, we really just didn't have the time, you know, to, to build all that in. I mean, we were given two years. We didn't even, I didn't even propose to do this MICE model until we were about a year in. And after seeing all the other products that we were developing and how they weren't going to help us, I said, hey, look, let's, let's go this approach. Um, so we'll see how that all turns out. Uh, I think the real question for us is whether we want to go seasonally within Ecosim or whether we want to actually try to simulate some of these mechanisms in Ecospace uh, more explicitly. And uh, I know Billy's had thrown some ideas out there as far as like a, a eco space mice model. So we don't necessarily need to do it over a grid, but maybe we have you know, four to eight boxes that can put fish in the right place at the right times of the year so that we get that overlap versus trying to force it through eco sim seasonal forcing functions. So we'll see how all that, how all that comes out. Um, you know, we're, we're looking for some support to, to, to keep that going over the next three years. Yeah, and you can actually cheat the system. I've just made a spatial mice model, which has um, detritus producers, stress water, salmon small, fr fr so salmon fry and salmon smalt. And it runs on a time step of, of one hour. So the, so the time unit is 12 hours. And the time step is one hour and we read in then tidal data for every hour for a month wow. month long period, and it actually works pretty well. And you so you can always cheat it. And in EcoSim, uh, if you enter the units, if your units is per day, so just in Echo Part, if you use units per day, then the time step is two hours. So you can start looking at things at, at different scales just by changing your Echo Part model. Um, but you, you don't want to get your hopes up too much about this, Dave, because uh, it go, the, the initialization going into EcoSpace uh, is done with the EcoPath parameters for things like diet composition. And when that diet composition is shifting dramatically through the course of the year, uh, that that's not captured properly often in the eco space initialization. So you can get away with some short runs like Billy is doing, but cumulatively over time, you, you often find that when you concentrate the predators in two different areas, use an average diet data with the bad initialize, where eco space doesn't have a really good way to initialize for the existence of those two seasons. You find you find the fish not getting enough in either season, and that's exactly you, the point, Carl, of the mice models is that you look at specific questions and you run the model specifically to run run on those questions. Not yeah, no, no, questions. right. That's not what I was talking about. I'm talking about the, just a problem, a technical problem, with specifying the rates of effective search of creatures for their prey when they're searching for two different kinds of prey at two different times a year. Oh. In a space, in a sense, EcoSpace doesn't know that that's going on during its initialization because the only initialization information it has is from the EcoPath overall annual diet compositions. And that's and we, we, we've never figured out a way of doing an EcoSpace initialization that properly recognizes the that it, it's going to be uh, uh, moving animals in ways that the rates of effective search will be calculated correctly when the animals are foraging in different habitats. Yeah, and that brings us into the, this interplay between seasonality and spatial models. Uh, Marta, you had some questions, a question related to that. Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, uh, great, uh, great talk, Dave. I, I was just wondering, you were mentioning some spatial uh, 
uh, processes of Manhattan and I was wondering if you are expecting um, very different results when you move into spatial temporal modeling. What is your expectation? Hmm. Um, I, you know, I don't, I honestly don't have a, a, a real firm expectation. I don't know what the model is going to show. I think that for one thing, I, I, I can expect what would happen, you know, given that striped bass Atlantic herring dynamic, um, you know, if we assume the spatial structure is there, the striped bass are less dependent on herring. But over the course of the year, striped bass and menhaden um, do overlap more. Uh, their migration patterns are more in sync. Uh, they both move north in the summer a little bit in the south. So maybe with striped bass and menhaden, we might not see a big effect of the spatial structure. But when we open that up, open the questions up to other species that are, you know, on the in the only exist in certain parts of the region, uh, then the seasonal spatial thing could give us a very different result than what a, a non-seasonal spatial model would. Thank you. Yeah. Good to see you, Martin. And on this interplay between seasonality and spatial modeling, uh, where it really comes into play is if you have seasonal aggregations and you have predation on on the, I'm getting a little bit confused here because I have a, I'm actually getting confused because I can see a Facebook at the same time and, and this there's a time delay so uh, it's like uh, something from another time coming in the, I was, I was just getting to, we have a case, for instance, where we looked at um, seasonal aggregation of herring and the impact sea lions may have on that. And to model that, it's really difficult to think about how to do that in a model that's not spatially explicit and which then can have the aggregations happening. So we can, we can do it in those models. Um, Max Greslick has a question for you, Dave. It's from... Um, so from Facebook, it says uh, you highlight the potential benefits of making the model spatially and seasonally explicit. What kind of timeline do you see as being realistic to have those features included in management decisions? <clears throat> oh, man. Um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, to go spatial temporal, you know, with the MICE model, if, if, if the committee is involved and, you know, part of the, one of the reasons we're able to do this in such short amount of time is that the committee members could run out and get all the data for us that we needed and, um, and, and, and chase it all down. And so if that process plays out, I think that, you know, probably in a year, you know, we could have something up and running in a, a spatial temporal framework. Um, now, there's the, the issues that Carl pointed out as far as the initialization. We've run into those troubles with the West Florida Shelf recently. Um, and... Um, to, to resolve those, that could take more time if it required some, some new programming. So it's not a Mars mission? Not a Mars mission? No, I, as long as, <laughs> I don't think it would be a Mars mission yet. Um, but if we were to try to take the full NWAX model, as you know, Max, um, which has a lot more complexity to it and go spatial temporal with that and all the migrating species that are moving in, that would be the moon. That would be the moon shot or the Mars shot. We're in the Mariana Trench, actually. Uh, <laughs> Sam. Where we Sam, Okay, Sam, you had a question? And I think after that, we might uh, want to continue with looking at the ecosystem model, the MICE model that uh, Dave has been looking at. Yeah, just to continue with uh, what Mart had said, you mentioned that the, um, the transition to Manhattan management with the Virginia Marine Resource Commission now solely uh, manage, manages this. And I was just curious if um, if there was like spatially explicit models to, you know, further, um, you know, this transition. No, um, now there have been, there's been a lot of modeling in Chesapeake Bay, um, but that's limited to the Bay proper. And, and the management, so the Virginia, Manhattan used to be managed by the Virginia legislature. Harvest in, harvest in state waters in Virginia was managed by the legislature, which kind of make, doesn't make a lot of sense. And just a year or two ago, they transitioned that to the Marine Resources Commission for the state. Um, and so now they're responsible for state waters, decisions regarding state waters. 
No, this came up a lot, you know, during our meetings and they were, we would often be asking, well, can you tell us how many we can catch on the other side of the Bay Bridge Tunnel? You know, we're like, no, this model, these models do, are not going to tell you that. These are going to give you a strategic advice. We can give you information on how to, where, how to set the tack. Now, you have to go out and figure out how you're going to allocate that tack to different states and federal state borders. So there, there's limitations to what these models can do. Indeed. And uh, Dave, should we uh, continue with uh, looking at the model? Sure. Um, so, all right, well, we have what, about 30 minutes left? We have 20, th yeah, 30 minutes. Okay, um, well, I had a few slides. I was gonna kind of walk, you know, talk about fitting ecosystem models, but um, I could go through those a little quickly and then open up the model if you think that would be best or if you'd rather I think it would be useful just to go uh, quickly through those slides and then look at the model. Okay. Indeed, yeah. So we are moving a little bit ahead of time here because uh, for for as part of this course we have not yet gone into how ecosystem works, how we do time series fitting, and so on. But uh, so the main intention will the next half hour is to give you an impression and have some ideas about what you can do, not the details of how you do it yourself. Right. And and even some of what I may show you today, uh, Billy may later on in the semester tell you that I'm doing it all wrong. But um, so you, uh, as you start building a model, it might help to come back and watch this then. Um, but I'll go through some of this quickly. Um, first of all, just some resources for fitting uh, ecosystem models, and these are these are links pulled from the website. Hopefully, they're still active, but if not, you can you can hopefully decipher what they are and go into the manual. Um, but there's a lot of good examples and tips on how to do that. Uh, first thing to think about when fitting models are the different parameters. So you do have your initial state parameters. Ecosim is sensitive to some of those starting values, and, and so you need to also think about those as parameters in your in your model when you're fitting them. Uh, the vulnerability parameter is is you know definitely the um, model's most sensitive to that, and you'll hear you'll hear more about that parameter um, over and over again. And then there's these other parameters uh, in Ecosim: the feeding time adjustment rates, the how unexplained mortality varies with foraging time, prey switching, and so on. Um, and so in the model, it's important to know that vulnerabilities are the only parameters that are estimated. And so if you change any of these other settings, these vulnerabilities are going to be conditioned on those. So if you change any of these other values, whether it's an eco path or your feeding time adjustment rates, uh, you should uh, refit your model because you'll get different vulnerability estimates, slightly different, or if you change a forcing function. Time series types, uh, main thing to is there's reference time series and forcing time series. Uh, always check your time series. I'd say when I've helped people fit models, you know, 50% of the time problems are in bad time series data. Um, now this, this is a key thing here that I've really started to, to do and try to impress all my students is to uh, define your scenarios in advance um, and, and make a table of the different runs that you want to do, different, different parameter configurations, and then go and fit those models. Um, and, and in theory, you, you, should try to, you should try to define these scenarios based on different hypotheses about uh, ecological processes and density dependence rather than just uh, kind of random shooting of parameter combinations. But in doing this, um, you can look at the results of each individual run and you may find where, oh, hey, when I had price switching turned on, I was actually able to you know, fit this and then you know, think carefully about what that assumption means ecologically. Um, but it's, it's a good practice, I think, to define a set of scenarios in the beginning and then fit them all using the same method. Uh, there's a, you know, a set of initial ecosystem diagnostics. This is described in the user guide. Uh, you should definitely go through that process before fitting a model. Uh, when you when you do go to fit the model, next diagnostic is to you know after you load the time series, you want to just look for groups that are crashing or increasing exponentially or where things are off scale. And what we're trying to do here before we actually estimate the parameters is just to get ecosim in a better starting place before utilizing the vulnerability search. Because if there's something wrong with the scale, say between your your catches in the time series and your catch in the model. Ecosim is going to try to 
reconcile that through trophic dynamic processes when it's actually just a, a error in your, your time series input. Um, let's go through that. Uh, how many parameters to estimate? Um, you should estimate in any given run no more than the number of reference time series that you have minus one. So this is the best practices in the Heyman's et al. paper. Uh, one of the things that we I'd hope to I'd like to show you uh, here in a few minutes is this repeated search uh, method that I've used, uh, where we actually repeat the fitting process several times. And this because ecosim can be prone to these local minima. So when you open an ecosim model, all your vulnerabilities will be set at two, and you'll estimate some of those. Um, <clears throat> but if those if those values of two are in a you know put you up here, where you need to be down here, um, then you might want to. Uh, try this repeated search. And what this does, it will search for the most sensitive vulnerability parameters and estimate them. And then you'll go back and you'll search for another set of the most sensitive vulnerability, vulnerability, vulnerability parameters and then estimate those. And you repeat that process until you get um, stabilization in the, the sums of squares in the AIC. And so you can see here on these plots, you know, after we do this, typically after about five times, you see the, the AIC stabilized and the sums of squares no longer decreases. Uh, but if you, you, know, you want to do this probably say at least three times and you'll, you'll definitely improve your sums of squares. Now in the end, you'll estimate more than K vulnerabilities, but there'll only be K free parameters at each individual search. And so I think about this sort of like estimating parameters and phases where you get a set of parameters in a good parameter space and then you can turn on others um, and you kind of go through that process. And so you would end up estimating more than K parameters, uh, but no more than K at any single time. We can get into discussions about overfitting and um, free versus fixed parameters uh, in, at, a, at another day. Uh, these other diagnostics, FMSY, it's important to look at that uh, as far as to understand why you might get good fits to the data, especially when there's not a lot of strong contrast in your data. Uh, you can get vulnerability estimates that um, would lead to some unrealistic responses to phishing. And so it's good to check these equilibrium FMSY curves. So for example, here we see with Menhaden, uh, as we have low vulnerabilities, we get higher FMSY. High, high vulnerabilities lead to uh, lower FMSYs. It's typically the pattern. <clears throat> uh, another diagnostic similar to the similar to the ecosystem, the the equilibrium FMSY is looking at unfished biomass. So here with striped bass, um, when we when we look at the if we set F to zero under these different vulnerabilities, you can see how it increases. And we knew that in 1985, uh, that they were about 10% of their unfished biomass. They were in a pretty overfished condition at the start of this model. Um, and so, vulner so we know that it would need high vulnerabilities to actually allow that biomass to increase. And this is because the vulnerabilities, they, they regulate the consumption through the prey dynamics. Um, and so by regulating consumption, it's going to regulate the biomass gain. So low vulnerabilities, they do not increase their consumption and therefore cannot um, experience biomass gains when it's overexploited. So for a species that's overfished or something like an invasive species, you usually need to have high vulnerabilities for those recoveries to take place. Uh, stock recruit curves, I would look at that stock recruit exercise when you get there. It's, it's, this is really critical to understanding um, how um, the productivity of these stocks that are implicit in the models. And then these vulnerability caps are something that we've started, we started doing as part of this Minhaden exercise because when we fit the model and then we ran it through the FMSY analysis, we would get, we would sometimes see these, this dynamic instability, especially when we get out to the high fishing mortality rates. You see there with the blue line. And we were able to isolate that down to a single vulnerability parameter that was estimated at 1.0, and that was a vulnerability of zooplankton to menhaden. And when we increase that value just a little bit from 1.0 to 1.1, then that dynamic instability went away. <clears throat> then we also have another issue with a lot of the vulnerabilities being estimated at the upper bound, which is like one times each of the 10, um, and whether or not those are ecologically reasonable. And so one way to think about that is how high can predation mortality go 
when a predator biomass is increasing. And if you express this as a fraction of the prey M, then you can specify a vulnerability that you could then reduce that down. So for example, here, if we say that uh, where this lambda here is 0.5, that would imply that a predator cannot account for more than half of the predation mortality um, of its, cannot account for more than half of the natural mortality of a single prey item. <clears throat> and so if you, you know, in, in complex systems where there's multiple prey and predators, you would expect these to be sort of low. I mean, a single predator is not gonna account for all the natural mortality of a single prey item. Um, so you can constrain some of these vulnerability estimates just using a spreadsheet and the, the ecopath base uh, predation mortality rates uh, to get some alternative vulnerability parameters. And these should be tried as like sensitivity values. So if you have some estimates that are really high, you could cap it down. And what we found was that when we applied these vulnerability caps, it really didn't change the model that much because we were still at a really high vulnerability value. It just goes from one times each of the 10 to something like 20 that might make more sense uh, ecologically. And it really didn't change much in the fit, but it had a, had a pretty profound impact on some of the projection scenarios, especially at really high or low fishing mortality rates. And so this is also described in the, the appendix in the paper. All right, so that's all I have just as a kind of warm up to fitting. Um, and now we've got enough time to, to open the model and, and walk, through, walk through it just a little bit. I was muted. I was just saying while you while you get set up here. No, I don't. I actually don't uh, disagree with what you're saying. Rather, I would uh, encourage uh, participants here to, when you're working uh, with actual time series fitting, go back and and check the presentation. There's a lot of things in there, and uh, you you need to really go through those details and think about what uh, the steps involved. Yeah. Uh, let me second that. I mean, that, Dave, that was a really great presentation of things you need to do to look for goof screw ups and put limits on things and do sequential searches. Don't expect to get the right answer the first time or even the third time. Yeah. I mean, I think just from experience, when I was fitting that West Border Shelf model and I was kind of doing it blindly, I sat there. I think I probably spent two months, you know, turning every knob and switch and, and trying to work track down, you know, what the effect of each decision. But I think if you structure it in terms of let's make a table of a dozen or so models that we want to fit and think about those in, as different representations of different hypotheses. Yeah. That's and, a much more structured, much more efficient to do it that way. I would say. And one more one more word for me, because we'll be talking a lot about uh, fitting to time series is you will never get the perfect fit. It doesn't exist. You can you should play with it. What I do is I, I try different things and when I get to something I think is really good, I look at it, I see what's in it, and I throw it away and I start all over again. And I try it again and see if I get to something similar. But trying it a number of times is an important part of this process. All right, so let me introduce you to the mice model real quick. Um, okay, so we got our 17 functional groups. Uh, we have three ages for striped bass, and these are set up based on trophic, trophic ontogeny as well as fishery selectivity and some of the movement patterns. So basically the, the six plus striped bass are the ones that are migrating up and down the coast from North Carolina to Long Island Sound. The two to fives are more resident. <clears throat> uh, the Menhaden is juvenile adults. These are age zero to one and age one plus. Spiny dogfish, bluefish, juvenile adult, wheatfish. You get it. So we started out with these groups. We had to add anchovies in because a lot of these other species feed on anchovies and there just wasn't enough prey. We aggregated all of the benthic invertebrates into a single benthos group. The, the full model, I think, had four or five zooplankton groups. We lumped that into one and just a phytoplankton group, no other primary one of the things that we did with the diet composition here, so there's this, this row here called import. So we, we took the, the big diet matrix from the full model and then aggregated those diet proportions into the mice model groups. But there was these other groups that we excluded from the model. And so we put those in, in the import row. And basically what this means is that there's a proportion of the consumption that is gonna remain constant over the simulation time period. So that's my interpretation of it. 
Um, and so even though they may have uh, predator and prey maybe going up, say for striped bass that has 26% of their diet being import, um, they will always get that 26% of their diet regardless of what the other prey are doing in the system. I, I see Carl is, is thinking hard on that. Uh, how we structured the fishery, uh, we assigned one fleet for each species. So we have a, a striped bass fleet, a menhaden fleet, spy dogfish fleet. We did this to basically to keep things separate. And actually we could have, because we ended up driving the model of fishing mortality, we could have had a single recreational fleet in there, but we weren't exactly sure if we wanted to do uh, separate effort uh, manipulations and we wanted to keep those, uh, keep, keep the, isolate the effects of harvesting one species from the other without getting into the bycatch uh, and discard issues. So clean fisheries for each, for each species. And if we look at the basic estimates, um, as, as the previous girl pointed out, uh, we do have these low ecotrophic efficiencies for Manhattan, uh, 0 0.08, 0 0.154. <clears throat> uh, another thing I always like to check are the mortality rates. So this will give you your fishing mortality, and predation mortality rates, which you can see are, are fairly, uh, fairly low for Menhaden, um, considering it's a forage fish. All right, so let's go into EcoSim. Uh, you guys can, can poke around with this model uh, if, if you'd like to, there's not much else. I do wanna go back to the diet and kind of just highlight, you know, who's eating Menhaden real quick. Uh, so we have the juvenile menhaden are preyed upon by age zero striped bass. At this at this age of at this stage of striped bass, they're mostly eating um, small crustaceans and shrimp and crabs and things, as well as uh, anchovies. And then the subadult striped bass are eating a little bit more menhaden, both juvenile and adult. And then the the age six plus striped bass are are eating juvenile menhaden, but they're the only ones that are really preying on those older menhaden, so the age one plus. Uh, we also have predation from spiny dogfish, bluefish, and weakfish. All right, so I'm going to open up um, EcoSim now. We'll, we got time to do a round of fits real quick. Um, so when I open up EcoSim, whenever I structure these, I always try to think carefully about how I'm going to name my scenarios and, and then your time series files. Uh, so we're going to go with basically, I, I like to set up a scenario that basically has all my defaults so I can always go back to a starting point. And then I'll load my time series file. And so we can see that the uh, time series, we have a bunch of different CPUE, Long Island Sound, you know, trawl surveys, uh, fishing mortality rates, and, and reference catch time series. Fishing mortality, we've got fishing mortality time series forcing for pretty much all the groups, except for spiny dogfish who don't have a stock assessment. With this group, we're forcing catch instead. <clears throat> and then if we, now before you go on there, Dave, you, know, you, you guys, when you're learning to use these, these time series things, you gotta watch out that you have two different kinds of time series. Time series that are used to force the model and time series like fishing mortality rates and time series that are used to uh, that to which you're comparing the models predictions, but they aren't forcing the model. So there, there's time series that are telling you whether or not the model's working and time series that make the model work or not. You wanna watch, they're all thrown in there together in one file. Yeah, that's, that's right. And then when you have fishing mortality and fishing effort, uh, it's also important to know that your fishing effort, fishing mortality will override the effort time series as well. I see a lot of people get confused on that. Um, all right, I'm just going through the steps here. All right, so now we've, we've got our time series in. So now we can run the model. But let's, let's first look at our vulnerabilities. Are all, well, let's reset these. the baseline level or the default. 
And then our group info is set up with all the, the default values, except for the, the youngest age stages, I turn on the foraging time adjustment rate to allow for some um, DC dependent compensation processes and to give a, a more realistic stock recruit curve. And so this is my default setting. Vulnerabilities of two and foraging time adjustments on the youngest age stances. So if we run the model, haven't done any fitting, uh, we get a, you know, this is your interface here. We have a sums of squares of 2,582. Uh, one of the things you can do, you can click on each group and then use your down arrow to see which groups are contributing the most to that sums of squares. So striped bass, the sub-adult and adults are accounting for a lot of that um, uh, residual error. And so you can go through like that just to kind of keep an eye on, identify what might be the most problematic species in terms of the sums of squares fit. It's also good to go to your group plots and inspect these and make sure nothing is crashing. Um, you can see that we've got the model in a pretty good place. It's sort of you know, splitting the difference in the data, uh, but it just needs to be tuned. All right, so now um, let's go through this fitting process. I got time to do one round, I think. So in the fit to time series, and you will probably get more of this later in the class. So the fit to time series interface, um, first thing that I always do is I turn off that reset Vs on run because if I accidentally click that sensitivity of sums of squares again, it'll, it'll set everything back to two. But what this matrix here is, is basically showing you all the, the where there's a predator-prey interaction. So for each, each black square is a vulnerability parameter. And you can specify which parameters to estimate by drawing them in there. So all of these that are the same color will get, it's like a block of parameters. They will get estimated with the same value. If you wanted to estimate another, you know, another predator, different color, so you get the idea. You could go in and just estimate one parameter if you if you know there's a particular parameter that you you want to estimate alone. So there's a lot of flexibility in how you specify the blocks of vulnerability parameters to estimate. If they have the same color, they're going to be estimated with the same value. They'll share that parameter. So to clear that, click back on black and and reset them. All right. So now what I'm going to do is kind of walk you through that repeated search. Um, so. Uh, the first thing is to identify which parameters are most sensitive in the model. And so there's a nice feature here that will go, we'll walk through each parameter. So did y'all see the little pop-up screen or do y'all see that now? The sensitivity of sums of squares? Of yeah, yes we do. Okay, good. Um, and so this will open up and it will allow you to search for the most sensitive uh, vulnerabilities either by predator column or by predator prey. What it's going to do is it's going to walk through each um, each predator prey interaction, change the vulnerability a little bit, and record the sums of squares. And then at the end, it will allow you to transfer which ones are most sensitive. So for this mice model, we did this by predator prey. So it's going to walk through. You'll uh, have to explain me at some point why, because this is very inefficient to do it that way. Yes. To predator. I yeah. Just, this, this I, and I can't through. and I can't explain it. We'll be talking much more about this. Uh, so you don't maybe don't need to, but in the course we will be talking quite a bit about this. Right, and um, and we're sort of coming getting crunched for time, uh, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. Uh, but but he's exactly right to do this with a big model with a lot of interactions would take a long time. But it just took a couple of seconds with the mice model. So that's one of those oh, keys. It's not it's, it's not a time question. It's really a question of uh, that is very very inefficient in the sense of. Um, how many parameters you can estimate, plus um, the expectation that this relates to a predator more than to a predator-prey interaction. That uh, I can't explain what this what this means. That's that's my problem with it. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, I know we had some discussions on that uh, a couple of years ago, Billy. Uh, anyhow, all right. So we ran that search uh, sensitivity search. We know that we have 28 reference time series, so we should estimate no more than 27. So I set this number down here to the number of uh, parameters that we want to estimate. And then that is going to transfer these to the search interface, all right? So now these are the vulnerability parameters that will be estimated, all right? So once you've identified the most sensitive K minus one parameters, 
quick search. And so you'll watch it'll iterate. The iterations will be shown in this bottom panel. And it usually takes on about seven to 10 iterations before you start to see it stabilize. I'm not sure why it's taking longer now. It's the demo effect. Yeah. I think probably because Zoom is eating up some resources. <clears throat> but what we're doing here is, um, you know, we're, we're allowing it to, to solve for these vulnerabilities that all started at two. So it's going to estimate new values for each of these vulnerability parameters, reducing that sums of squares. And you can see we made a big improvement on that second iteration going from 2,500 to 1,500. Now, I don't know what this max fish mortality panel does. I've never used it. I have no idea. You, you can avoid that it goes out to extremes by removing a group, by putting in a cap on how, how big the fish mortality is allowed, and that will, may stop the vulnerabilities from going. Ah. So while this is going, one of the one of the things that I've thought about, um, Philly, is possibly if, if there's a way to add some penalty bounds into the search, you know, to keep them off of those ones and 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 the one times each of the ten. That's really <clears throat> when we were playing tricky. around, the open six machine is really really tricky to to work with. Carl, is that possible? Oh, yeah, you, you can put penalties on them. Another way of doing that would be to search in the log space. We never have implemented the log space because it makes it easier to constrain things. We haven't messed with that. Uh, you know, just while you're while it's waiting here, another, another thing here is there's also an ability to uh, look for better ecopath parameter estimates in a multi-SIM capability. The problem is that you cannot use a, a continuous nonlinear estimation procedure like it's doing now to search for ecopath parameters because they have uh, the 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 space of parameter combinations in ecopath is got these boundaries in it uh, acceptable parameter values are bounded to have all ees less than one so the only uh, search procedures that can be used when you have that kind of bounding or ones we call they're called random search procedures. So the uh, if you want to mess with whether you can get better model fits by changing ecopath parameters, what you do is do this multi run thing, and what it does is it randomly varies the ecopath parameters, not systematically like this search is doing, but randomly, and uh, and then uh, tries to see if it can find uh, ecopath parameter combinations that work better for fitting. The general experience with that has been so far that it screws up. It tends to uh, generate high biomasses and low trophic interaction effects almost always when you run it. Yeah. You've, have you done any of that, Dave? I have, and I, I kind of came to the same conclusion. The other thing I struggle with with that is that the vulnerabilities are conditioned on the diet compositions and the predation mortality rate. <laughs> it's the, they're interacting on you, yeah. Yeah, it's, and so like, do you do the eco path first, and then if the vulnerabilities change, and do you go back and reestimate? So it gets kind of circular as well. Yeah, it it turns out estimating the, those uh, eco path things and the vulnerabilities at the same time is is almost impossible to do. Yeah, I would uh, it's, it's just too complex and nonlinear estimation. And problem. and we will be talking quite about a bit about this later when we talk about uncertainty and, and how we go about that at, at many levels. So you have now a run. Yeah, so I, so I just, it. yep, so I just stopped this. Um, it, it may have kept going, but it wasn't going to improve much more. And so once you've, you know, this is one iteration of the fit and, you, and it's probably always wise to go back and see, you know, see what you got. Uh, and so we now have sums of squares as much. So lower. it has estimate it has estimated vulnerabilities and transferred those vulnerabilities back into here. Right. There you go. Yeah. So these yeah. are the estimated vulnerabilities. You see it puts a lot of them at the upper and lower bounds. Um, there are some of them that are and you can you can see now that he's wasted three uh, three uh, parameters on estimating, for instance, for the first group. Right. Yeah. Yep. So these were estimated. All, all, the, all the 
the cells here that are not a value of two have been estimated away from their yeah. defaults. Now, so that was one fit. Um, and we can see that, you know, we're starting to get some better fits to the data now, not, not great. Um, and it's, there's also some scaling issues here that make the plots um, look, look, look like straight lines. So let's go back and let's do another iteration. And this is, this is kind of what I wanted to show you guys with the repeated search. All right, so pay attention to where these, these colored boxes are. Why don't you show it in search group with time series? So what would happen if, if, you, if you press the button there called search group with time series, will that will. screw up what you want to do? It will. Uh, too bad because I, this is, this is my go-to. That, that's the one I always use oh, yeah. uh, because I find it much more efficient and explain what, what it does. I cannot explain what comes out of this. Uh, yeah. So, well, well, let me, let me, let me finish with this. Uh, yes. repeated search thing. So now when you go and you do another uh, sensitivity search by predator prey, we're going to get a different set of 27 parameters. Oh, so okay. now that we've got that first set in, in one parameter space, we're now going to see, all right, so how do these, yeah, you know, what, now what are the most sensitive? So you're cheating, cheat. Dave. Am I cheating? Oh, it's good I didn't do the review. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would have hammered this because you are actually, now you're, cheat, you're, you're not doing 27 anymore, now you're doing 54 parameters. Well, not, it's, it's not that they're all different, but this, so this is where we get an argument of uh, what's free parameters and fixed parameters. So a, val a value of two is still a parameter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and yeah. I'm not estimating 54 at any given fit. I just have different initial yeah. settings. Uh, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm yeah, like we, can, we can agree to disagree on this. <laughs> That's okay. And then there's Carl's approach to these things, which is not to use this uh, at all initially, but instead to go and look at the group info like Dave's been doing and just look specifically to see which groups aren't working properly, uh, aren't behaving properly yeah. and go in and target vulnerabilities that will affect the, the dynamics of those individual groups and, and search on those. Yeah, and, and, and one important thing here is we are estimating vulnerabilities and vulnerabilities are not just obscure uh, nuisance parameters. They actually have uh, an interpretation. Basically, uh, they, they say how many times can this predator increase the predation mortality it's causing on its prey. So 10, vulnerability of 10 means it can increase, we are allowing it to increase the predation mortality on the prey up to 10 times, and that if the predator really grows. So these are numbers we can actually understand now here. And, and also you can think about where the where the species is in ecopath relative to carrying capacity and how you know, how much you might expect. That's what it boils down to. I should when say- you have should a high vulnerability it. in a column representing a juvenile predator, like the first column for Manhattan small juveniles, high vulnerabilities in that column imply that it wants to fit a nearly straight line stock recruitment relationship rather than one with strong compensation. It wants to say that for striped bass, if you have big values in that first column, for example, that the initial re recruitment is much lower than the recruitment would be if the striped bass population were much larger. And that's where when we applied those vulnerability caps and we did the the FMSY analysis, the that's where those issues would, would appear. You would, you, they, would, they would be more evident then. Um, now, uh, one thing I, sh I should probably mention here is, is the mo one of the motivations for why we, I, we went this approach is because to get away from the strategy that Carl just described where, where there's basically one man in the room that can fit that model. We wanted something that was reproducible uh, by either commission staff or other scientists and so we we came up with this approach. We said, hey, look, you can do these steps, A through Z, and get to the exact same point that we got um, with our model. And so that was one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons that we, we pushed this approach. And so you can see here now, I stopped it early, but you can see we get a, another pretty big reduction in, in the sums of squares, because we've estimated, added a few more parameters. 
we go back and we see we've got some other parameters that are no longer at two. And if we repeat that process, we'll continue to get improvements. If you do it about three, four times, the, your AIC in sums of squares starts to stabilize. Yeah. I really think you're just ch chasing noise when you when you're doing that. Could you just uh, if you just for as a last thing here, could what happens if you cancel here? You set V set V's on run, and you go search group a time series. Then you're going to be estimate not five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven parameters. What search now? This is the moment of truth. Yeah, and uh, sorry, folks, we are actually getting past 11 o'clock. Uh, so we shouldn't be doing this since we have two hours at our disposal. Um, but we are. Well, let's see, let's see where Billy gets with the... I don't think it'll get as low um, as the first iteration, but it is more efficient. Okay, we take bets now, just to keep the, the time going and to finance Equipart. So you can all place a bet of a, of a few million dollars and uh, and the one who gets it, get half of it. And, you know, 50-50, isn't that it? I'll, I'll put my Reddit, my uh, my GameStop <laughs> stock on there. In a way, what you're doing here is almost equivalent to, to trying to do a bunch of separate stock assessments mm. on, on those individual populations. Yeah. If you think about these vulnerabilities as basically a, a stock recruit parameter, then uh, yeah, that that would be equivalent. So it's getting close to the original something. Oh, yeah. so I'm just going to go ahead and stop it. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll just never know. No, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> it, it what this illustrates is there is no correct way of doing this. You really have to explore it and think about it. And the worst you can do is to think that you found the holy grail when you when you're doing this. You you you, uh, you won't, but you will learn a lot from doing it. And you'll you'll see in the paper the figures that we produce. We show our best fit run, but in the background we show the the trajectories from all thirty uh, ecosim configurations that we fit and. And so it does show that there's some discrepancies, but overall, you know, when we fit it through using this approach, we would get pretty similar results across the different model runs. All, All right. right. Well, I think we're it's, out of time. We are running out of time, yeah. So, Dave, thank you very much for volunteering to take uh, shots from us and to even more for the presentation. It's been very useful. And uh, it's, uh, it was a good presentation, too. So thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for uh, listening in and joining this discussion. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Zoe. See you Tuesday. <laughs>